Okay, I think it's working. Hello. Um, so happy ice day? I don't see any ice, but I believe it, I guess. So um, this is your class for today, guys. So we're gonna talk about speciation and I'm gonna try to finish up chapter 22, which is on the origin of species. Uh, and since we're doing a video lecture today, I hope this is okay. You can meet my puppy. If you haven't already met her on my Instagram. Puppy. You can see the puppy. Okay. That's Ziggy Stardust. All right, all right, all right. We'll get started. So let me share my screen with you. Oh, little housekeeping. So first, um, for lab today, and presumably tomorrow. We can't do lab in person, but you need to be in person to do a lot of the exercise. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to post a, uh, basically a video where I walk through you through what we're gonna do and I show you parts of the microscope. You know, we kind of basically do anything that we could do virtually, we'll do that. And, um, and then next week, and so take notes, because when you come in next week, we're just going to have to do both, you know, microscopy slash bacteria and protists. We're just going to have to do a lot, but that's okay. Um, and, you know, upside, I guess today you have a short lab since it's going to be a video. So I will post that sometime this afternoon. Okay. It's kind of a bummer because next Thursday, I am going to warn you, I'm not going to be feeling good because I have my, my vaccine dose, my second dose. So we'll see how that goes Thursday lab. Okay. Now let me share. Oh, hold on. There's something else I wanted to show you. If you haven't seen it already, um, let me pull it up. So you probably have seen this. And if you haven't, <laughs> I was going to show you this in class today anyway. Um, so, and since you can watch this on your own time now, why not? Why not show you? It's about the lawyer who, you know, um, accidentally turned on a cat filter during Zoom court. Also, if you hear weird sounds, my dog makes noises. So that face. if you haven't seen this, I have to show you. Oh, you finally made an appearance. That okay. I believe you have a filter turned on in the video settings. Uh, you might want to uh, uh, take, take We're trying to, we're tr can you hear me, Judge? I can hear you. I think it's a filter. It, the, it is, and I don't know how to remove it. I've got my assistant here. She's trying to, but uh, I'm prepared to go forward with it. That's, I'm here live. It's not, I'm not a cat. <laughs> I, can, I can see that. Um, I think if you click the up arrow next to this. <laughs> Y'all, I'm not a cat. <laughs> okay. Okay, back to science. That was important though. So, all right. I believe you have a filter okay. turned on. <sighs> all right, so let's get going on speciation and prezygotic isolating mechanisms. If you couldn't hear that very well, just you gotta Google it. It's really funny. Okay, so I'm gonna share my slides. There we go. Okay. So where we left off on Monday, I'm going to check my time so I don't keep you here for three hours because um, I talk. So we were talking about reproductive isolating mechanisms. And remember, there's two kinds. There's prezygotic and postzygotic, right? Okay. So prezygotic prevents the fusion of gametes of sperm and egg. And postzygotic is essentially sperm and egg have fused, but something else goes wrong to prevent um, hybridization or to discourage it. So we talked about ecological isolation, 
right? Where you don't have overlap necessarily in habitats. Uh, pretty, pretty synonymous, similar to geographic isolation. And we talked about this is why lions and tigers, they, they don't overlap, even though they could breed. Okay, they don't overlap in their ranges, just to be clear there. So other prezygotic isolating mechanisms. There are a couple more. The, the next one is behavioral isolation. This is basically just like having differences in various cues, um, particularly courtship cues is the main thing here. So um, a great example of this you see with, and this is a visual cue, boobies. Um, various kinds, various species of boobies, which are these, this is a blue-footed booby here. They have elaborate courtship displays and in, in animal behavior, if you take that class, we will actually watch these courtship displays and they are hilarious. So this is a male blue-footed booby doing the blue-footed booby courtship dance. It's a, an adorable dance. And the female, she does not look very receptive, but they will not mate with other booby birds, boobies. They, um, they have, you have to have the password basically. Like it has to be the courtship display that they're looking for or they will, the female will not mate with the male. So this keeps the species separated. A few other ways this occurs are, well, more visual signals. So coloration. So in birds, they can look at other birds. This isn't just birds. This is birds, this happens in insects. Um, you have differences in coloration that the other species can, can recognize, okay? And this is, I'm just saying, species that occur together, sympatric species, remember that's species that overlap in their ranges, avoid mating with their own species, and here's how. So visual signals, Sound production. So this is differences in song. This is really common, again, in birds and insects, um, but obviously other organisms like amphibians. Um, any, think of an animal that calls, okay? And typically that is a, that particular call is a cue to members of its species. That is a sound cue, okay, that provides, um, an isolating mechanism through, through ensuring that courtship or mating behavior stays between the same species. So your book provides an example, particularly of lace, lace wing songs. So this was shown here, okay. And you have these three species of lace wings. Here's a little drawing of it, it's cute. And you see they have very clearly different songs. This is true, again, You'll see this in birds. We talk about this a lot in animal behavior. Um, so that is one of the ways that species can be isolated behaviorally. Also, you have differences in chemical signals, like with pheromones. Um, moths have very different pheromones, bees. So males will pick up on these differences um, in the pheromones produced by females. You also have differences in, in some species that communicate with electrical signals. Now, electrical signals, there's, so there's a species of fish um, that lives in Asia and it, it communicates with, it has like an organ on its tail that produces electrical pulses. And we think what's happening is that um, individuals of this kind of fish, they can tell if it's their species of fish or not based on, we think the electrical pulse rate, like they're kind of like Morse code. You could think of it that way. So these are all ways that species are able to isolate themselves behaviorally, okay? And like I said, we talk about all these since it's behavior and animal behavior. So if you're interested in this, take that class. We go way deeper. Okay. The third prezygotic isolating mechanism that prevents fusion of gametes is temporal isolation. It's uh, it's like a, do they still have missed connections? It used to be a thing in like the papers. Do we still have papers? Yes, we do. 
or on Craigslist. It doesn't seem like a safe place to do that, but there was a thing called misconnections where, um, well, usually they weren't separated by time, but you could think of it like two organisms don't overlap in, in when they reproduce. So since they don't overlap in their mating seasons, then they just don't, they can't reproduce, right? I mean, um, it's being it's being out of sync with your reproductive times. So an example of this, um, there are examples of this, examples of this among animals, also, especially, uh, let's see, you see this in aquatic insects. Aquatic insects have a really beautiful, and terrestrial insects have a really beautiful and elegant um, schedule like there's schedules among the species of breeding seasons and they don't tend to overlap in the mating season some of them do a little but not a lot and and that actually gives rise to differences and when when larvae emerge as adults which reduces competition for food and other resources which is really amazing anyway let's get back to this i get really excited about that so a good example, another example of temporal isolation, um, you'll see in plants. Your book provides a, an example from wild lettuce that grows in the Southeast United States. So these uh, species of plants, wild lettuce particularly, don't reproduce, they don't produce pollen at the same time. And since they don't, then they can't necessarily, they can't hybridize. Even though in a laboratory, you can hybridize them. Or, you know, if you have a field you're manipulating and you do it yourself, a human does it, you can experimentally hybridize those two species. But since their timing of reproduction is not the same, they don't hybridize in nature. So they're different species, um, especially in, especially according to this biological species concept, because remember, this is the framework we're working under for today, um, for today, because we're going to learn different species concepts. This is just one. Okay. My personal favorite prezygotic isolating mechanism is mechanical isolation. So mechanical isolation is where, how should I put this gently, delicately? The parts don't fit, my friends, that do not. Hmm. Upside of online class, I can drink coffee because I, because I'm not wearing a mask. Okay, and yeah, I can, you can see my face. Anyway, so mechanical isolation. This is where you have physical incompatibility. This can occur in plants or animals. It's not just like the animal copulatory organs don't fit, um, though that is a big one. If the, you know size can be an issue, uh, shape among the insects. I talk a lot about insects because I know a lot about insects. So sorry if you're not a bug person, but. Among the insects, there is a huge diversity, especially among the male reproductive organs, the copulatory organs specifically. And oftentimes certain, certain uh, genera, well, families of insects, the copulatory organs are actually how you determine who's who. <laughs> um, that's how you identify them. But that is one example, you know, being completely physically incompatible with the copulatory organs. In plants, that looks more like, um, say, this is what I'm showing you here. Say a bee comes or other pollinator of some sort, and it, you know, it alights on the beautiful flower, and it gets, because of the flower structure and where its reproductive organs are, it gets pollen on a certain part of its little fuzzy body, right? The cute little fuzz. So say I'm a bee and I have pollen right here. Okay, and now I'm gonna to go to the next flower. Do, 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 do. Well, this flower is a different species. So it's reproductive organs are a little different. And so when I get on the flower where I have pollen, is not gonna to correspond to the female reproductive uh, organ of the flower? It's not gonna to correspond to the pistil of the flower. So I'm not gonna be able to deposit my pollen there from the other, flower, right? So if they were the same species, it would work, it would fit, right? But since they're not, there is no pollen deposited and thus no hybridization could potentially occur. And then the, the last, this is the last prezygotic isolating mechanism. So remember there are five, okay? This is prevention of gamete fusion. 
So this is pretty simple, actually. It's just there's no attraction or fusion of the gametes, particularly um, in, you see this a lot in external fertilization. This is like fish spawning. This is what I'm showing here. Fish spawning, you know, fish release sperm and eggs into the water. And that is how the gametes fuse. And you just don't, they just don't hybrid. They just won't fuse. That's prevention of gamete fusion, very simply. It can also occur in organisms that have internal for, or fertil, fertilization, sorry. <laughs> so uh, if you have internal fertilization, it could be that perhaps there is something about the female vaginal or cloacal, which is different than a vaginal canal. It's, it's the reproductive opening. Maybe there's something about it that um, the conditions in there that are preventing the sperm of another male that maybe that female mated with from fusing, from, from being viable in the canal. So maybe, you know, the conditions are too acidic, but in this species for this species sperm, something like that in internally um, fertilizing organisms. So those are the five prezygotic isolating mechanisms. And you know, I should have come up with a mnemonic for this because, because you got a, you got a vowel in there. Hmm. Uh, hmm. Well, stay tuned. I'm gonna come up with one. I mean, I see the word, let's see. You got pet, mb, no, that's not gonna work. I'll come up with something and I'll help you remember. Okay, now. Those are the prezygotic isolating mechanisms. There are five. There is one, you're gonna love this. There's one postzygotic isolating mechanism. And that's just meh. Hybrids either don't live or they can't have babies. And that's it. Hybrid inviability, they don't live, or infertility. And the most common example of this are like mules. I'll come back to that. But another example of this are the leopard frogs. Leopard frogs are super common. You have probably encountered a leopard frog and we're like, I don't know what this is. Or maybe you did. Anyway, leopard frogs are actually a group of related species. Here are their ranges. And it was initially thought that they were one species. But because of postzygotic isolating mechanisms, the little baby leopard frogs, if you have hybridization across these two species, they won't develop. The gametes can fuse in these across these species, but there are issues with development of the tadpoles, the embryos into tadpoles. So you don't actually end up typically with tadpoles. Um, they tend to, to die before they can fully develop into tadpoles and then later frogs. So that's one example of a species um, a group of species that are isolated in this way. Here you have mules, like I just mentioned, right? So these are sterile. Um, and usually in these cases, like the hybrids, either they're sterile because they have abnormal sex organs or they, d they just don't form gametes at all, which, you know, like true sterility in terms of internal sterility. Um, and, you know, even if you have hybrids who are just not as, as adapted to the environment and they don't survive as well, that's still technically a postzygotic post isolating mechanism because over time selection will select against those hybrids. And over time, they sh in theory will be excluded from, from future populations. It'll be those two populations may become more and more isolated and less likely to even produce hybrids. You see this in plants as well. And in fact, I think I'm gonna give you an example um, of phlox, which is a really pretty flower. So these distinctions are all driven and maintained by natural selection, okay? So selection um, does not favor hybrids typically if they have this, you know, lack of, well, first of all, sterility, but also lack of um, good adaptation to the environment. Yes. I'm giving you a moment to process. Okay. Now, 
Let's talk about criticisms of the biological species concept. Okay. I told you, remember I told you in class, I think it was last time, that you know you go to a taxonomy session. Uh oh. Oh no. My dog hears someone outside. Sorry if you heard a loud thing. There are, you know, if you go to a taxonomy session at a conference, if a conference still has one of those, a uh, scientific conference, sometimes people get a little heated about taxonomy and they also get heated about, you know, who is, you know, is, are they two species? Are they one species? What is a species? This is still something that scientists debate. So criticisms of the biological species concept. First, it's difficult to apply this concept to populations that are geographically separated in nature. Because, and you know, I don't think of that as a, a huge criticism, but um, because, you know, who knows if they could hybridize, maybe they are really one species that just is just in two different places. Though we do say, right, that being ecologically isolated is a prezygotic isolating mechanism that leads to do two different species, right? Okay. And by extension, many of these organisms that you know you might call two different species hybridize in captivity, just not in nature. It also does not account for asexual organisms. So they're totally left out of this. It's like, okay, so so what about those guys? Because they they're asexual? How are they all just was different species? What's going on? That's not real, right? So it doesn't account for those guys. And it also does not account for many other processes that are um, important for maintaining a species identity. So it's a, a little too simplistic in some ways, according to some folks. So those are some of the criticisms of the biological species concept, okay, or how we define a species in this way. So let's just move just a little bit and let's talk about reproductive isolation a little bit more and natural selection. So how do, how does speciation happen? Hmm. This is the question we shall consider. So if species are defined by the existence of reproductive isolation, uh, isolation, then the process of speciation is identical to the evolution of reproductive isolating mechanisms, because that's kind of the name of the game here, right? Reproductive isolation. And natural selection, and it says may, often tends to, it reinforce isolating, reproductively isolating mechanisms. And this is a continuous process. Um, so, so sometimes, you, you, or even today, we often will see organisms that, um, that are really close to an ancestral species. Basically, we have evidence, you know, that some are just partially reproductively isolated. We can observe that happening. And you're basically watching a snapshot on this long time scale of evolutionary processes by natural selection occurring. So here you have, you know, a species, two different populations that may be separated in some way, okay? But they can still inbreed. So so gene, there's still gene flow. Gene flow is where you have two different populations, but you have individuals hybridizing between them. Okay, these hybrids are still a conduit for genetic exchange. But if, for example, if you have two populations of a species that become isolated in some way, we just talked about ways that things can become isolated. Maybe they become geographically isolated, even on small scales. Those two species begin to become genetically distinct, okay? As they are isolated from one another over time and they respond to different selection pressures in the environment. And so even if they do hybridize over time, you may have and often will have hybrids that are not well adapted to either one environment or the other, wherever these populations are or an intermediate habitat between the populations. You may have hybrids that are not well suited to that habitat. And in that case, you'll have a process called reinforcement happen, happening. Reinforcement is a process where 
essentially it's, it's reinforcing the isolation. That's how you can remember it. Reinforcement is a process where selection improves prezygotic isolating mechanisms. Okay, so if you have hybrids that are, you know, not they're not very fertile, they're not well adapted to the environment, then selection will over time exclude those hybrids, right? And this is reinforcement. And so hybrids will be essentially selected out of the gene pool. And those two populations will be truly reproductively isolated. And then according to the biological species concept, they're two different species. Oh, I X'd them out. There you go. We X'd out the hybrids because of reinforcement, because they were not well suited. So selection is reinforcing, prezygotic isolating mechanisms, and we have new species. Okay. Here's an example of reinforcement. So in flux, so flux, you've probably seen flux and didn't know it was flux. Maybe you did. It's a really pretty flower. And sorry, my dog is being cute. Okay, so you have various species of flux. This is really cool, guys. So this is Drummond's flux. Well, this is a picture of Drummond's flux, okay? This is a picture of pointed flux. So Flux Drummondii and Flux Cuspidata, and they overlap in their ranges. Okay, so Drummond's Flux looks like this. It's kind of like periwinkle, kind of light bluishy um, in this part of its range. And Pointed Flux is very similar, okay? All right, where they overlap, this is crazy. Where they overlap, Drummond's Flux is red. It's a completely different color. It looks like a different flower, but it's still Drummond's Flux. Isn't that crazy? Here's the deal. Where they overlap, basically butterfly, okay. Let me start from the beginning here. There are various genes that control color, like tinge and the deepness of the color, okay? And where these two species overlap, Drummond's flux, those alleles that code for deeper, redder colors are selected for. They are favored because butterflies, and remember, you know, selection is not trying to do anything. This is just a natural process. They're taking advantage of, but not with any will, butterflies have color preferences. Different species of butterflies prefer different flowers, flower colors. So by these flowers being red, they attract certain butterflies and those butterflies will stay with the red flowers. And thus you have a higher likelihood of reproduction. And then some butterflies prefer the pointed kind of, you know, still bluish flocks. And so you have higher reproductive success among both of them, really, when you have this change in the gene expression of Drummond's flux. So basically, this is reinforcement because selection is reinforcing those prezygotic isolating mechanisms because you have two different colors of flowers, okay, instead of one very similar color, and thus, you have isolation. Basically, you have butterflies only going to, to certain flowers and not crossing the two. This is ecological isolation. It's not mechanical isolation because they do actually have very similar reproductive parts. They're both the same genus of flower. Um, it's ecological isolation, just so you know. Oh, there's two S's there. Sorry about that. Oh. Okay. So, Oh, I apologize. It went off. Let's go back. But while we're here, I will fix that. Yay. Okay. So let's talk about ooh, genetic drift and how it gives rise to speciation. Genetic drift is super cool. So 
what is genetic drift? Genetic drift is essentially a, a random event that gives rise to reproductive isolation, okay? A couple of things that are important to remember. Genetic drift is more likely to occur in small populations. So a genetic drift does occur and can occur in large populations. It's just not as, um, it's not as pronounced typically because you have more genes available in the gene pool. You have greater genetic diversity and so you have a wider gene pool there, um, but you have genetic drift is more pronounced in small populations and you have a greater likelihood for genetic drift, okay, to occur. You also have uh, various mechanisms of genetic drift. Um, you know, being a part of a small population increases the pot potentiality for that, for that drift, but also you have founder effects and bottlenecks. And I'm gonna show you what those are in just a minute. Um, one example of founder effect in your book occurred um, with fruit flies, Drosophila, in the Hawaiian islands. So Drosophila are very different. They have courtship behaviors and in their courtship behavior among the Hawaiian islands. And it's thought that those differences are due to uh, founder events. And what that is, is essentially where in this case, some of the flies may have been like been just flying and they get whoa, wind <laughs> and been like blown to another island. And there's only like two of them there. And they're like, oh, OK, I guess it's just us. I guess we'll make some babies. So that's what a founder effect is. So founder effect is where a, a tiny, small subset of a population becomes reproductively isolated. I mean, really, that's kind of what both of them are. But founder effect is where, you know, a couple, a very small subset become reproductively isolated. Um, an example of this would be, and you see sometimes like greater incident of diseases come out, especially like recessive diseases, because um, just because you have less genetic variability. So uh, an example in humans would be if you've ever heard of the Amish. I hope you've heard of the Amish, they're out there. Um, but if you've ever heard of the various like polydactyly, which is having extra digits, that's really common among the Amish because the Amish were a small subgroup of folks in a community, in a, an Anabaptist community that came over from Europe, primarily Germany. And it, it, they stay within their little group. They don't they typically stay within the church. They don't usually go out and marry folks from the general population, at least in the United States, well, anywhere. Um, but because of that, you have these interesting things like polydactyly. Um, other, other examples, well, I'm gonna show you a cool video about this and a, a bottleneck. So a bottleneck is a little bit different. That's where, um, well, I'm just gonna show you the video and then we'll talk about it. Don't let us down, video. Maybe I'll just let you watch it on your own time. Hmm. Okay, that's okay. So just look at this slide and um, that's no problem. And you will want to watch this video because it talks a little bit more about genetic drift and, and founder effects. So I'm just gonna talk about them then. Nope, oh, and then I just stopped sharing. Online class, you guys. Okay, here he is. Here he is. Okay. So, oh, here we are again. It might work if I do it like this. It worked a minute ago. Huh. Oh. Weird. Hmm. Well, never mind. All right, well, let's just talk about him then. If it will let me. <laughs> okay. There we are. Okay. So, there we go. 
Yeah, we know you're not going to do the thing. So let's just move on. Okay. Here we are. Okay. So, oh my gosh. <laughs> no big deal. Okay. Here we are. So let's talk about them. You don't, you can watch the video in a minute. So this is where both of these are processes where you have a larger original population and then some critical event happens. Okay. Typically so with founder effect, that is some small subset of the larger population breaks off. And typically it's like they go somewhere else. They're a founder population that may be they explore a new island that may be um, that they are somehow cut off through maybe a flood. So there's some sort of barrier to dispersal now, something like that. That's the founder effect, okay? You have a founder, founding population. The other is the bottleneck effect, or a, we just call it a bottleneck. A bottleneck is where something happens and everybody dies except a few of the guys. It's not as fun as the founder effect because everybody does. Um, yes. So, so the bottleneck is, effect is a little bit different just because you have some sort of random event that causes a large amount of mortality and this reduces populate the population number. And in turn, you have much fewer genes available. And so you'll have a greater likelihood of genetic drift. Okay, so those are two really important um, aspects of, of situations leading to genetic drift. Okay, because you end up basically just reducing a population size in one or in one way or another. Okay, so now let's talk about how adaptation can lead to speciation. So populations of one species can adapt, of course, to different circumstances, right? Different selection pressures and they accumulate differences. Um, and some of those differences may in turn lead to reproductive isolation, even if they're sympatric or relatively sympatric. Um, here I'm showing you two examples or example with whales. Um, basically, well, what I'm getting at here is that you can have organisms that have different food resources. Okay, so these are two whales that are eating two different things. And that leads to, that could lead to reproductive isolation because they have differences in their niche. And those differences in the niche in turn lead to speciation. Okay. This is true for things like food resources. I mean, think about Darwin's finches. Um, this is true with respect to, you know, maybe a plant becomes adapted to a different kind of environment. Maybe they can they become more adapted to the cold. And so their, their range increases and they become a little isolated, things like that. Anything that can lead to reproductive isolation, but including adaptation can lead to speciation. Okay. Exa another example are with lizard dewlaps. <laughs> Look at them, they're cute. So um, this is the Anolis lizard. These are the Anolis lizards. And they have different, you notice they have slightly different dewlap covers. It's because as these lizards, different lizards moved into different habitats, their, their dewlap cover had to adapt to essentially ways they could be seen because this is instrumental in mating for them. If you can't be seen, you can't mate. Ain't that the truth? So this, you have different species because you had reproductive isolation arise from the fact that these organisms who had moved into different habitats, okay, adapted so that they could mate. And so this is an example of adaptation and the environment leading to speciation. And those adaptations in turn, you know, you had a kind of a combination of ecological and behavioral isolation that further encouraged and reinforced speciation. Okay, so let's talk about the geography of speciation. Yeah, we can do that. Okay, so speciation is a two-part process, right? First, initially identical populations must diverge. And secondly, 
reproductive isolation must evolve to maintain the differences. Remember when we said this, we said this at the beginning, essentially um, speciation and the evolution of reproductive isolating mechanisms, they go hand in hand, right? And if you have gene flow between two populations where you have some individuals crossing between the populations, that homogenizes the gene pool. And in turn, that gene flow erases those differences. So gene flow, it, it reduces the likelihood or prevents speciation. So speciation thus is much more likely in geographically isolated populations, which makes sense because it's harder for gene flow to occur, right? So how, and I already mentioned this a little bit, how might, how might organisms become geographically isolated? It's not, you know, just one thing. It could be that you have explorer organisms who go off and find a new habitat. You know, maybe a bird flies to a new island. That's what it's showing you here. And in turn, they become geographically isolated and thus reproductively isolated. And in this case, you know, you may actually have genetic drift occur because if you only have a couple of organisms go to that new, um, not a couple, but a very small amount, number of those organisms move to the new habitat, you may have a founder effect. Not always, but you could. Okay, so this is one example of how or, um, populations can become reproductively isolated. Another is perhaps a barrier to dispersal comes up. For example, floods. You see there, you have, these are beetles, order Coleoptera. These are beetles, maybe a flood comes through and you're like, no, Marie, no, John. Like you're totally cut off from each other, right? Um, other barriers to dispersal. So this is a good example. I'm trying to think of another good one. Fire, fire can, can cause an issue like this. So of course the forest typically will grow back, but you may have organisms running off, right? To escape the fire and thus become reproductively isolated. Um, other barriers to dispersal. So mountains are barriers to dispersal, but they don't necessarily, they don't typically separate populations by like quick chance events, like maybe a flash flood could. Um, but just so you know, those are barriers to dispersal. And then you also may have extinction of, of intervening populations. So you may have a population here, A, you may have population B, and then you could have a couple of things. You could either have a population C between them and there's all this gene flow happening. That could be one situation. Or you could also have them be one big population. Okay. And, and if you had the ABC, that would actually be a meta population, which we'll talk about in ecology. But you could also just have the one population, right? Because it's kind of what we're talking about here. And maybe there are some intervening individuals in a particular place and something happens. Maybe humans alter the environment in some way. That's a good example. And individuals in the middle die. And so then you have these two populations, but there's no gene flow because the conditions in the middle are no longer, um, they, don't, they no longer support the organisms who live in these two, now two populations, right? So extinction of in middle individuals could lead to geographic isolation as well. Okay, so this gives, this gives rise to what we call allopatric speciation. So we talked about sympatric speciation where speciation is occurring. Well, we're gonna talk about a little more in a minute where speciation occurs, where organisms overlap, right? Where they live in the same place. Allopatric speciation is what occurs when organisms populations are geographically separated. And those separated populations are more likely to evolve substantial differences leading to speciation because they're in different habitats, right? So they're responding to often very different selection pressures. Um, and we're not gonna talk about so I mentioned Ernst Mayer. Ernst Mayer, uh, I think in the last lecture, he's mentioned throughout this chapter in your book because he is one of the people who really developed this, this theory. And actually we don't even talk about the specific kind of apopatric speciation that he was a proponent of and developed. Though you are welcome to look it up on your own. It's called peripatric speciation. P-E-R-I-P-A-T-R-I-C. I usually have my little board and I would write it. I'm sorry about that, but you could look that up. He lived to the ripe old age of 100. He died in 2005. Anyway, 
So, so allopatric speciation, right? That geographic isolation gives rise can give rise to differences. A really nice example of this is the little paradise kingfisher. So they're actually currently still, they're all one population, not population, excuse me, they're one species, oh, right? But you knew they weren't in the same population because they don't live in the same place. So the mainland kingfishers are all very similar. There's not a lot of variation in their phenotype, but kingfishers who live on the various islands around New Guinea, around New Guinea, excuse me, are very different from the mainland. So we're actually able to see, oh wow, you know, this is, you have geographic isolation that's giving rise to reproductive isolation. So we're kind of seeing the speciation occur. That kind of we are. So sympatric speciation, again, is where you have speciation that occurs without that geographic separation. They overlap in their ranges. And this can often occur because of polyploidy. So polyploidy is where individuals have more than two sets of chromosomes. And, you know, this, this the speed of speciation among animals versus plants can be very different. Well, and other organisms can be very different um, because for example, polyploidy um, and changes in chromosome numbers can occur a lot more quickly and more easily in plants, though it does occur in animals. It's not as commonly, not as often, but you have two kinds of polyploidy and here's what's crazy. So polyploidy, again, let me just go back and make sure you, so this is where individuals, polyploidy is where individuals have more than two sets of chromosomes. So you are diploid, right? You have two sets of chromosomes. If you were tetraploid, you would have four sets of chromosomes. Some plants do, man, plants, plants are nuts, you guys. They are crazy when it comes to reproduction. Okay, so here's what's cool, polyploidy, can set the stage for instantaneous speciation. You heard that here first, you heard it right. Instantaneous speciation. Well, okay, so let's talk about the different kinds of polyploidy and how that can happen. So first you have autopolyploidy. And this is where all the organisms, not organisms, all the chromosomes, arise from a single species. This is typically due to an error in cell division that produces tetraploids or organisms that have like four copies of the chromosomes. And if you are, if this is in, a, in an organism that is normally diploid, then they won't be able to produce fertile offspring with the normal diploids. However, and this is why I'm talking about, you know, this, ha this happens in plants, it can still be a thing because you can still have asexual reproduction occur. Okay, cool. Then you have allopolyploidy. Um, this, this is pretty crazy. So this is where you have basically two species hybridizing and then you have, and then typically like tetraploids. And the resulting offspring then have a copy of the chromosomes of each species, each parent species. And so, but here's the deal. They are infertile, um, but they also, just like the autopolyploids auto can reproduce asexually, okay? So both of these can, but here's the difference. Allopolyploids, can become fertile. All of autopolyploids cannot, they cannot. And here's why allopolyploids can become fertile. Because if their chromosomes spontaneously double, then they become polyploid. I'm gonna show you this because you're probably like, wait, what's happening with chromosomes? I don't know. This is what's happening. So I will show you. Oh, I want to tell, I want to show you where it is in your book too, because this is one that sometimes folks have a little trouble with. And let me find it. Okay, page. Uh, if you have the whoop, online class, okay, 
if you have. Blah. Which edition? 11th edition. If it's not the 11th edition, it's probably around there. Around this page. It's page 449. Okay. And it'll show you these guys. But so here, this is showing you alley polyploid speciation. Okay. So here it is. Instantaneous speciation. So you have parents, there's species one, two, species. I want species one to be over here, but whatever. So you have their gametes. So this is, remember, what is this? This is meiosis, right? So you have gametes. Okay. And they have a baby. All right. Now, if there is no doubling of the chromosome number, then the chromosomes, I mean, it can't reproduce sexually. It can still reproduce asexually. Okay, potentially. However, if you have a, a doubling of the chromosome number, then you would actually have viable gametes and sexual reproduction could be possible with another tetraploid. This happens in plants. You might be like, how in the heck? This is a lot of stuff that's got to happen. Plants, man. Plants can do it. Okay. So that is allopolyploid speciation. It's an instantaneous form of speciation because you have these hybrids who are now able to potentially reproduce with often other hybrids, but not necessarily. Okay. Very cool. All right. Let's talk about adaptive radiation now. That, so, so we just talked about... Um, allopolyploidy and autopolyploidy. And we can we can talk about that a little bit more next class if you want, because I have found in the past, sometimes folks have questions and I can run through it again in person. Um, I wish I had a dance for that. I have dances to teach you certain things, but we can talk about it some more. But do, or maybe you should watch that some more, right? So, and make sure you read this part in your book. Okay, cool. All right. So let's talk about adaptive radiation, mainly just because I want you to finish, we gotta finish class, I'm sorry. But like I said, maybe I'll spend some time with it. Oh, maybe I'll spend some time with it in lab today. I need to write that down. Okay, so adaptive radiation is where closely related species that have recently, uh, have recently evolved from a common ancestor and they have adapted to different parts of the environment and they're, they're different species, but they're related. Okay, so basically it's like Darwin's finches. Darwin's finches are the classic example of adaptive radiation. And this typically occurs in a number of ways, mainly two. First, this can occur in an environment with few other species and many resources. And a good example is the Galapagos Islands and the Hawaiian Islands because when islands form, there are not a lot of organisms there. And so organisms colonize. And so you can have organisms adapting to different parts of the environment. And thus that can lead to adaptive radiation over time. And particularly in archipelagos, we see this, um, which are groups of islands. This is also true, I said the Hawaiian and the Galapagos Islands. So we see this in the Galapagos with Darwin's finches, right? And so that's one way that can happen because you have maybe a new habitat like islands, it's like they form and there's lots of resources, but not a lot of species. So it's species adapt to exploit different parts of the environment to reduce competition. Or you could have a catastrophic event leading to the extinction of other species. So you're like, wow, everybody died, except me. <laughs> and so there's lots of resources in that way. <laughs> Okay, but adaptive radiation really is predicated upon what we call a key innovation. And a key innovation is a new trait that evolves within a species, allowing it to use resources that it couldn't access before. So examples of this would be lungs in fish or wings in flying animals. I say birds and insects, but yeah, birds and insects. Well, and bats, I'm not gonna leave out mammals. This, um, so adaptive radiation for, for, some, for adaptive radiation to occur, you have to have both speciation and adaptation to different habitats. 
Okay, and I'm going to show you the classic model of this, which is the island archipelago example, because archipelagos, groups of islands are like the best way to explain this and the most common way we observe it. So an ancestral species flies from the mainland to colonize an island. There it is. Beautiful. It goes to the different islands. We're colonizing. Beautiful. Okay. The populations on different islands evolve to become different species. So they're closely related. They share a recent common ancestor, but they do, there's speciation occurring, okay? Due to those different, that geographic isolation, those different selection pressures. Okay, stay with me, because now you got choose your own adventure. So you got species on different islands. All right, so two things can now happen, potentially. You could have either, you could either have the new, you know, those species evolve different adaptations, living in different places. That's what mean, in allopatry means. They're just living in different places. And so they're evolving different adaptations. And then they all colonize the other islands. So you end up with a group of closely related, related species living together that are adapted to different parts of the environment. Or, or you could have the species, speciation occurring. And then before those adaptations really develop, they colonize the other islands. And then on the same island in sympatry, which means living together, the species or islands, the species evolve the adaptations while they're living together through a process called, and they, and they differentiate in their adaptations more and become more different through a process called character displacement. So let me review this because this is this gets a little crazy. So adaptive radiation, you know, where you have potentially, let's use finches, all these birds, right? They're closely related, but they have differences in beak size related to their primary food resource. Now, this, so you can have two, one or two things, have two ways this can happen, okay? You have an ancestral population, it spreads to different islands, it speciates, okay? All right, then this is all based on whether colonization or adaptation and further, further differentiation of those adaptations occurs first. Which of those occurs first? Okay, so it could be that they evolve the adaptations geographically isolated and then colonize or they colonize and then through character displacement become more different and further specialized in their adaptations. So now I'm gonna tell you what character displacement is. It's important, you should know what it is. I'm almost certain you will be tested over this. I, I will do that, okay. And we talk about character displacement in ecology too, because I mean, this is ecology. Ecology and evolution are very, are so tightly linked, okay. I mean, all of biology is linked to evolution, but anyway. So what is character displacement? Here's what it is. You have two, two species. And let's say they are, they're reproductively isolated. They can't mix, they can't hybridize, but they are ecologically similar. They have some overlap in their niches. That could be where they live. That could be where they eat just something about their niche, overlaps. Okay, natural selection as a process favors individuals that use resources not used by other species. That is to say, selection favors reduction in competition because competition, I'm getting a little far into this, but competition review, reduces fitness. We don't want that, I mean, Selection doesn't want anything, but selection will act in such a way, the, the process will. So it's to reduce competition because that will increase the fitness of each species. So if you've got niche overlap, boom, niches. I'm gonna just show you, there it is. So let's say this is an example with body size. It could be beak size. It could be, you know, anything about an organism. I'm trying to think of other things the size of the food they eat, I mean, you name it. Um, time of day that foraging occurs, anything about a species niche. Okay, 
So this is just what we call a frequency distribution. This is just showing you, right? This is the average body size, this here in the middle where the, that bell curve is at the top. That's the average body size in species one. This is the average body size in species two. But notice there is considerable overlap in the body sizes of these populations. Well, what character displacement does is um, it selects for individuals who diverge from that overlap. So typically more extreme phenotypes within each population. It leads to in each population individually directional selection away from each other to reduce niche overlap and thus competition. So then over time, character displacement will lead to further divergence in this example, body size. So you have a greater difference in niches. You have less niche overlap or less, um, less overlap between the two, um, the two species. And that, in, and that in turn increases fitness. It's, it's favored by selection. And so this is one of the ways that adaptive radiation can take place, right? If you have colonization occurring before those adaptations become really pronounced, character displacement will shape them to be more different because that reduces competition and increases fitness. Isn't that balling? It's pretty cool. Okay. I'm just going to finish the chapter. It's okay. Take a break if you need to. It's a video. Okay. So I'm on a roll here. Though, sorry if I get weird with my voice. I haven't um, had to record a video in a while. So, okay. So other examples of adaptive radiation, you got lots of species of Drosophila. Drosophila, this is why we study Drosophila in evolutionary studies. Um, it's because they have short generation times and we can very easily observe speciation and evolution occurring in a lab or in the field. Um, you could talk to Dr. Oliveira about it. She is a Drosophila researcher. She, yeah, that's her field of expertise. She's an evolutionary biologist. She knows the fruit flies so well. Anyway, the Drosophila species, the many of them living in the Hawaiian Islands highlands are very diverse. They're another example along with Darwin's finches of adaptive radiation. And so you had just like a few fruit flies that, you know, got blown, we think, to different islands. And then over time, you know, adaptive radiation occurs by that process I just showed you. You had these empty habitats that were just basically filled. And so you have fruit flies in turn that are all related, they're closely related species, but they occupy very different niches. So you have predatory fruit flies, herbivores, or detritivores, that means they eat dead organic matter. All of these different um, adaptations to exploit various niches in the environment, okay? And so I'm just telling you about the differences in Darwin's finches here. Um, I'm not gonna stay on this very long just because like I said, it's another example of that, okay? Cool. And it's finches because Darwin's finches reached the, those islands before other land birds from the, near, from the mainland, from Peru. Okay. So with Darwin's finches, just briefly, Differences between those species, we're, we th we're likely, we think, were from character displacement. Because again, you're trying to minimize competition because that favors greater fitness in both species. So that's why you have all these different finches that are closely related, but occupy different niches because they have very clearly defined adaptations to exploit some different part of the environment than the other related species. And just so you know, you don't have to like memorize, okay, there are ground finches, there's tree finches, there's vegetarian finches, they only eat tofu, there's swarbler finches, vegetarian finches don't eat tofu, I'm sorry, that was a joke. You know, you don't have to memorize those. I just really want you to know, okay, we've got all these finches, because of these processes, the processes and the and adaptive radiation overall. That's what I want you to know, just so you know, because sometimes people get a little, little 
focused on the details. They're like, oh man, I got to memorize all, look at this. Whoa, I got to memorize all these species and genera. No, you don't. I'm just showing you, this is an example, one of our prime examples, along with the fruit flies of adaptive radiation. But you should know how adaptive radiation can occur and the various tracks it can take. That's important. And another example of adaptive radiation, and I want you to know these examples. You just don't have to know. You don't have to know all the species. But if you want to learn them, go wild. Just don't stress yourself about it. Okay. And if you want to do that, maybe you should be an ornithologist. So let's talk about adaptive radiation in fishes, because I love fishes. Um, and just so you know, so fish, if it's the same species, fish is plural. If, it's, if you have different species, fishes is plural. I mean, I fool myself the first day of my master's program being like, fishes? I don't understand. What? And my wonderful and amazing professor was like, uh, did no one ever tell you that if they're different species, then it's fishes? I'm like, oh, nope. <laughs> so I'm telling you today, since no one told me as an undergrad. Okay, so let's talk about the Lake Victoria cichlids. So cichlids are, this is a cichlid, they're fishes um, that live in this huge, basically like a freshwater sea. It's huge in Africa. And there were over 400 species of cichlid until recently, I'll tell you why in a minute. And we know that there were cichlids that arrived 200,000 years ago in this lake. And so the way that adaptive radiation occurred here is essentially you've had habitat islands created by water level changes, particularly things like drawdown. So when you have creation of habitat islands, it doesn't necessarily have to be an actual island. It could be on land, it could be a patch of that land, it could be in water in this case. And so changes in water level, isolated populations and encouraged speciation, okay? And specifically an event 14,000 years ago may have really stimulated speciated, speciation because you had the creation of these little pool habitats or smaller um, habitat islands that isolated populations and led to speciation. Okay, and there's a huge diversity of cichlid fishes now. Now, remember though, with for adaptive radiation to occur, what must you have? You have to have some trait, right? That can really adapt or provide space, room to adapt to different niches in the environment. Okay, so, oh, this is just showing you how, they, they have lots of different feeding niches. That's the main difference is they have lots of difference in feeding niches. So the key, you have to have a key innovation, right? You have to have that key innovation for adaptive radiation to occur. And cichlid fishes, it's a second set of functioning jaws. That's nice. So here, it's just showing you, they have a second set of functioning jaws and thus there was um, evolutionary room essentially for the mouth parts of the fishes to adapt to all these different feeding niches. Isn't that crazy? And so then you, you have all of these different habitat, or not habitats, feeding niches that could be exploited in the, in the lake. Okay, I think I'm just gonna mention this because your book says this. Um, you got a lot of extinction happening though. Uh, I told you there's a huge diversity of cichlids, but over 70% of cichlid species um, have been, have gone extinct. Well, many, many, many have gone extinct. There are conservation efforts to um, rectify this, but all of this is because of the introduction of the Nile perch into the lake in the 1950s. And that decimated the, um, the diversity, the cichlids in Lake Victoria. So I think we're going to, we may talk about this a little bit more, um, but we, we do mention, we talk about it a lot in ecology, because this is an example of a conservation project um, and, and how humans can influence biodiversity and sometimes we have to fix things. Okay, briefly, let's talk about the pace of evolution. I know guys, you're like, Dr. Dodd, this is longer than 50 minutes. And I'm like, I know <laughs> because I was behind. So like I said, stop the video, take a break if you need to, um, but I'm gonna press on just so we can finish this chapter so we can move on to classification on Friday. 
Okay, so pace of evolution, like the pace of this lecture. Uh, so you have various schools, or you had really schools of how, well, you still kind of have some, mostly had schools about the pace of evolution. And there were all these theories about how it happened in terms of the, the rate. And so the main ones were gradualism, which is basically where you have the accumulation of small changes. And this was like the main thing for a long time. Um, and then it changed. And then um, some dudes. So Niles Eldredge and Stephen J. Gould, Gould, I should say it right, G-O-U-L-D. They, uh, they put forth this theory of, of evolution, of evolutionary pace rate called punctuated equilibrium. Some people call it punk eek. Evolution nerds call it punk eek. That's right, evolution nerds, I said it. I don't know if Dr. Oliveira calls it that. She probably doesn't because she's cool. Anyway, so punctuated equilibrium. This is different from gradualism because you don't have the accumulation of gradual changes. It's kind of self-explanatory. You have long periods of stasis, which I will tell you what that is in one second, followed by rapid change. So, so this is what it's showing you here. You've got same, 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 same change, right? Same, same, same speciation. And, you know, species going on because you had speciation. So now you have two species, 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 the species is chilling, speciation. Oh, now you have three. So stasis, just so you know, is um, a lack of change, something staying the same. So long periods of stasis followed by rapid change. That is punctuated equilibrium, okay? And the reason you have those long periods of stasis is because of stabilizing selection, which is where the average phenotype is favored in a population. So it, the average phenotype stays the same because the selection pressures are such that that is favored, right? Our oscillating selection, where you may have changes that go back and forth, but within one particular kind of frame. Okay, here's the deal. Gradualism and punctuated equilibrium, like it's not all punctuated equilibrium and gradualism. It's actually, those are, those are a spectrum. They're two ends of a continuum, okay? It's kind of, somewhere in the middle and actually depending on the organisms, it could be closer to one end or another, depending on the time too. I mean, it's like I said, it's just kind of a continuum. Okay, so the rapace of evolution kind of moves between the two depending on when and what organisms. Okay, so this is the end of chapter 22. Um, I think that it's important for us to talk about because extinction is a part of, of evolution, right? Speciation, the natural end of speciation is extinction. So biodiversity has gotten, is exploded over the last 600 million years, right? Um, and basically you'll have periods of rapid biodiversity, you know, development, but then you will have sharp declines. And you've all heard of these, they're called mass extinctions. I'm sure you've heard of it. So there have been five mass extinctions before now. You are living through a six mass, sixth, sixth mass extinction. Rip biodiversity. Makes me sad. But it is what happens. It's, it's part of the natural process of things, even though humans are impacting it, which I'll mention in a minute. So I told you five mass extinctions have occurred, right? And during those mass extinctions, we're not just like saying a lot of species went extinct. We're talking like most of life on earth, like 96% of all species in, in any given extinction, okay? So you have tons of, of species wiped out and, you know, not all groups, it's not just like a wiping of the slate. You know, um, often people will joke like cockroaches will inherit the earth, insects will inherit the earth. Yeah, it's exactly, I mean, that's not, it's not actually inaccurate because not all organisms will be affected equally, especially depending on the, the impetus of the extinction event, right? Because that's a selection pressure. It's just a really, 
really intense selection pressure, right? Um, so, you know, dominant groups can perish. For example, I don't know if you know this, but there are no longer dinosaurs. But dinosaurs used to rule the world, right? What was that? Where is the Jurassic Park quote, right? Dinosaurs go extinct, man inherits the earth. No, wait, Ugh, I can't do it. Y'all look it up. It's a man creates. No, I can't do it. God creates dinosaurs. Women, I just know that women inherit the earth in the end of that quote. So I'm cool with it. Okay. Um, so you are living through the sixth mass extinction. The number of species decreasing right now, the impetus for this six max extinction is us. I hate to tell you, it's us. It's us, guys. It's us. It's sad, actually. I don't like it. Here's from your book. So here you have the dip. So this is number of families. So remember, families are just one order of um, order. Order is about family. <laughs> um, they're just one way of grouping organisms taxonomically, right? Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. We should do the song, right? Kingdom, phylum, class, and order, family, genus, and species. This is the correct order from the largest to the least. Okay, and then millions of years ago. So you have the various mass extinctions that have occurred during different periods um, in geologic time. Okay, now why? And they all had different, you know, different um, events that led to those mass extinctions. Some change in the environment, right? Right now, we are the change in the environment. And this is the end of the chapter, but I want to be sure. And this isn't in your book. I'm telling you this, but I want you to know it um, because because you have an ecologist teaching you this class. So according to a very smart man whom I love, his name is E.O., like E dot O, Wilson. His first name is Edward, but he goes he goes by E.O. Wilson is his scientific, you know, it's what, how his papers are authored. He, um, he is a very famous scientific communicator. I really encourage you to read his books. But, and he's a myrmecologist, which is one of the leading ant ecologists in the world. Anyway, sorry, he o. Wilson is my celebrity science crush. Somebody tell him if you see him, y'all aren't gonna see him. But if somebody's over there with, well, anyway, okay. So E. O. Wilson says that um, a hippo is destroying the environment. I know I'm just as shocked as you about the hippos Somewhere a hippo was like, it's not me, but hippo is an acronym to help you remember this. So what are the human activities that are causing a mass extinction that are leading to sharp, sharp declines in biodiversity? And we're even talking insects. Paper came out a few, maybe last year, a few years ago, it said that there has been a sharp and precipitous decline in insect taxa, which is not good because we, especially pollinators, because we rely on pollinators for life. So here's the hippo. We're just gonna, I'm sorry to end class on a very depressing note. Um, so the first, the H is habitat destruction. That's what I'm showing you here. Habitat destruction. If you don't have a habitat, you, you can't live because you have to adapt very quickly if your habitat is suddenly, is suddenly gone and organisms just don't, they don't adapt that quickly oftentimes. Not, you know, the pace of evolution, right? So that's the H. The I is not on here, but that's invasive species. Humans like introduce invasive species into new habitats and they often will, um, they're often better competitors than the natives. And so they just wipe them out. The first P, is pollution, which I'm showing you here and here. Um, this this water, this bird, you see, it's ingested plastic. I could I could do an entire probably three hour lecture on plastic, um, which and I and here's the thing. Full disclosure, I use plastic. I hate plastic, and I pretty much quit using it before the pandemic. And then the pandemic happened. Anyway, so. P pollution is a huge, huge 
problem. And if you're interested in plastic pollution, it was on Netflix. So if you find yourself with some time, you can watch A Plastic Ocean, um, which, which speaks to this pollution problem. It's, and like I said, it was on Netflix if you have that. Um, if, oh, I should trigger warning that. Trigger warning, you will watch a bird die. For, oh, I get, I get, I get emotional guys. Like I, <laughs> I've seen a plastic ocean like four times and I watch it again just to remind myself. Right. Um, it helps me reduce my plastic use and y'all seriously, every time I know it's coming and I always, I always have a hanky ready. I'm like, <laughs> the bird, man, the bird, the bird just ate. That's all I was doing. <sighs> anyway, so trigger warning, because it's very disturbing and upsetting to watch this bird like choke and die from malnutrition um, from pollution okay the next p before i get real emotional and you get mad because class is long um is okay it's it's population um i'm not going to debate this in, in, in a freshman class there's it's not really a debate per se it's more like i'm just not going to talk about the philosophical um and all the other things that go with talking about human overpopulation that this is just the argument put forth by E.O. Wilson. And so I'm just telling you, um, but he says human overpopulation and, and I'll add this human over exploitation to meet the demands of the human population, whatever size um, is a problem because we're exploiting way past what we can, what the environment can support. Like I said, this whole slide I could talk to you about for an hour. Um, feel free to ask me questions because this is my favorite thing to talk about because our our survival, like your species, our species survival is, is relying on us figuring out solutions to these problems. And the last thing, O, is over-harvesting. That's blood. Um, so we are over-harvesting a lot, it's bad. Like. Um, may, many of you may have heard by 2050, it is, we're expected to have more plastic in the ocean than fish. And that's a twofold problem, pollution, <laughs> and we are overfishing. So um, there, are, and, okay, just not to leave you on a really sad note, because I actually may post this to my YouTube too, because now I'm, I'm remembering to do that. Um, don't be sad, because there are solutions. There are solutions and people are working on those solutions and you could work on those solutions. And there are things you can do right now to, to help with these things. And so you can look into that, but, but focus on speciation right now when you're studying, okay? This was just kind of a conservation aspect because we're talking about extinction because that is kind of the end of the, this is the end of the train, speciation, extinction. Okay, so that's all of chapter 22. We did it. I guess I should thank the ice, huh? yeah. And um, I'm going to post a video later today. I'm probably gonna make it like right now where we're gonna talk about lab and how it's gonna work. So if you're in lab today, just watch that, it's no problem. If you're in lab tomorrow, it is, I'm not sure if we're gonna have lab tomorrow, but I don't wanna call it yet because I have hope, I have hope. But if we are not in lab, you'll use that video. If we are in lab though, please still watch the video because it's kind of like, it's like a pre-lab kind of thing where you'll you'll really be ready to go and be super efficient because you'll be like, oh yeah, I already know some of this stuff. Okay, so everybody watch it, I guess. Okay. That is all for now. Let me know if you have questions um, and you can email me. Since we're not having synchronous classes, um, uh, I'll, I'm, mm, I'll still have office hours. So you can still get on my virtual office at 10 o'clock and I will be there if you have questions about anything in the world. Okay, because I'm here for you, always. Okay, have a good day. And, uh, oh no, Morty. Morty's not gonna get to see you. Ugh, I forgot about that. I'm trying to stop staring now. Okay. Maybe I'll just end the meeting. <laughs> the best part of this is I'm gonna have to post this because uh, I don't, I, I am currently not in a position to trim videos. I don't, I'm still figuring that out. So 
<laughs> y'all it's stuck <laughs> so you can get off now that's fine and you or you could watch me sit here and flail on zoom oh, wow it's really it's like stuck that's hilarious okay well bye for those of you who choose to say maybe i'll sing a song <laughs> oh man okay it's like literally stuck on zoom <laughs> This is the funniest thing that's ever happened. I hope people are still watching this video because it's, y'all, I'm trapped on Zoom. I'm trapped. Save me, save me. My dog is also trapped in this room. I will, it won't stop sharing. I'm hitting escape, it won't stop. I'm hitting, my cursor's working. My trackpad works, but it won't. Nothing will click. Oh, this is hilarious. Maybe this, maybe today is the day I learned to trip videos because, oh my gosh. Hmm. Okay. All right. Let's try control out delete. Ha ha. Ha ha ha. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. I was like, it's not going to work. Ha ha. I got you, Zoom. Okay. 